the wrestling fans were on to wrestling. We were tired of watching Hogan with this stuff and uh, the big giant wrestlers and Warrior and Papa Shango and the Voodoo. And they, it reached a point where it was like enough. But it was really hard to fill the shoes of Hulk Hogan like with the next star. I mean, Warrior tried. I can't see, say he didn't do a good job. I thought he did a, as good a job as that person, the next person could do. I thought he, he, he drew well enough and he was over strong enough and he looked the part. And, and then when Macho Man, Macho Man was much more loved by the boys. The, the character that he played where he would play that he was really jealous, that, that's a real character. You know, I've seen Randy go off because um, somebody looked at Liz or someone. You know, and I, I always wondered because I was like, I looked at her lots and I never had any problem with them. Here's this guy. Like, come on, like, denying that he was on steroids. Anyway, the way ha Hogan handled it was so poorly done. Like, he was so pathetic how he handled it, rather than just sort of owning up to it you know, or giving some kind of an answer that would have sufficed. <clears throat> but I think um, he brought a tidal wave of headache and nightmare for everybody. Rick was, I remember he told me that he was having some problems at home or something like that. He was distracted. And maybe that's the case, but I mean, I remember actually going to Vince and going, I, I think he's sabotaging the matches, trying to sabotage my, like we keep screwing up the finish. When the bodybuilding thing started, it was, there's these bodybuilders, and who, who likes bodybuilders? I mean, talk about it, zeros in life. It was a failed, doomed enterprise right from the, who wants to watch bodybuilders that are not on steroids? I mean, there, I, there's no fascination with bodybuilders, period, but if they're not on steroids, like even less, like who cares? George Steele was one of those kind of guys, I remember George Steele doing lines of coke and partying with everyone else, and then like a week later, or a couple weeks later, they made him a, an agent, and he was just like one of the prisoners that got turned into one of the guards, and he was like, he was just a motherfucker, man. He was not a good guy at all. My brother Owen and Macho Man, I can actually tell this story now. They took his uh, halberdin, if he's ever wondering whatever happened to us, his uh, halberdin. Um, he had locked up with his passport and his colossopy bags and his pills and everything else and there's airplane tickets. And I remember Owen, he, him and Randy snuck it out in a, under a jacket to, to the car. And uh, later on that night, an hour later after we left the building, I remember Owen, we were driving over a bridge in uh, somewhere in like New Rochelle or something like that. And he opened the window and threw it out in the, and went sailing over the, into the river. Was this ridiculous? It was maybe the worst. It's right up there with the gobbledygook is maybe like the second worst idea they ever did. I remember watching it and going, ah, oh, that's awful. How did Owen feel about being put with Coco? <laughs> and how about those outfits? I think Owen was maybe <laughs> stunned. Stunned and uh, <laughs> I think he felt for sure that he was being ribbed. Um, <laughs> they were finally getting Owen back. He was sure mad at Jim. I'll tell you that. That's probably the truth. He was mad, at, really mad at Neidhart. And it's always bothered me that that they stole the idea. Sean knew then. Uh, here's my idea. So he and they stole my idea. They didn't ask me if they could use the idea. They stole my idea, and it was already in print before I ever knew that. But, you know, it bothered me because, uh, you know, the truth is I would love to have wrestled um, my brother Owen in a ladder match at SummerSlam instead of the uh, cage. It's a, it's a pretty screwed up time for Davey. He's got serious drug problems that nobody knows about, I guess, have maybe Davey. Um, <clears throat> all I know is that Davey gets injured or supposedly injured. I never bought that he was injured. Supposedly got injured with a staph infection and went home. I think it was the very first spot we did. I took him over in a side headlock or something, and he goes, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. He can't, couldn't remember anything. He was like blank. And that's one of the only matches where you see Bret Hart talking. On a, where you, you never catch Bret Hart talking in his matches. But you will catch me in Wembley. Vince said, we need you to go work for, work uh, in Memphis. And I said, well, I thought you said we couldn't work uh, outside WWE. He goes, well, you can't. And I said, well, you, you wouldn't let me work for my dad. Now you're telling me you want me to work for some guy in uh, Memphis. I said, but I can't work for my dad. I said, it doesn't make any sense. I said, on that principle, I don't really feel like working. 
that was the greatest day in the, of my life, I think. You know, and I always got to, like people say, why would you go back and work for Vince? It's like, that's why, because the guy gave me a chance in the first place. And uh, <clears throat> you wouldn't be talking to me now if it wasn't for what Vince did for me then. And uh, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> but he um, took a chance on me. I think when a lot of guys would argue strongly that I was not the right guy to put the belt on, wasn't the, didn't have the star power that, that, that he was looking for. Thank you.